Hello, it's David Willey again, the curator from the Tank Museum. And uh, we're going to try a question and answer session. These are questions that people have sent in. Um, you can see some of them on our Facebook site, on some of the videos we've posted on YouTube. And uh, bear with us, because obviously we'll try and work out the best format to be able to do this with. Um, so whether or not we do it just like this, or whether we try and do a live one or other things, we'll, we'll see how this, this goes. And also another thing I'm going to emphasise as well is there's quite a number of the questions uh, we've already probably done films on, or I know we've done films on a fair number of them. So we'll try, if you've got the chance, if you sit there, have a look on our website, go to that little YouTube button at the bottom of our website, that little with the arrow on, click that, it'll take you to our YouTube page and have a look there. If you, if you know all about that, that's fine. If you don't, have a look there because if you go to videos on our YouTube page, you'll see a great plethora of films, tank chats, all sorts of stuff, top five tanks that we've done before. And in there, there's many of those films that will hopefully answer the questions that you've been asking already. Uh, and I emphasize that because there's sometimes where we will repeat ourselves, it's bound to happen all the time, but other times maybe we, we'd be better off saying, well, look, if you wanna know about that, why don't you go to that film? Um, and also there's a number of areas, if you look at all the questions people have been asking, they sort of coalesce into, uh, even if this is not exactly the same question, fairly similar questions. And that again is where we'll see if we can put those questions together and perhaps do a little bit more thematic answer, um, especially if I can help here, you know, especially things like, you know, camouflage, uniforms, helmets, that type of thing, where I might be able to, if the weather's nice enough, sit in the garden and uh, or, or take you through one or two of these issues, a bit like we did with the jerry can um, video to start the ball rolling. So um, that's sort of some of the, uh, the background bit. So on with some questions that have already been asked. So if I start with this one, uh, Jasmine White on our Facebook site, she, she asked, Does, uh, is there a, any way of measuring the amount of CO2 that comes out of the Tiger tank? Does that sort of thing go on? Um, it certainly didn't go on at the time in the war years. That wasn't one of their emphasis there, although certain things were being measured, obviously key factors about an engine, such as how far it was going to go on what tank of fuel, what was the best settings for the engines, etc., etc. Lots of tests were done. I don't think CO2 was a particularly important one at the time because, again, they weren't thinking about it. And again, if the question is kind of indicating the modern era are worries about CO2, we haven't. You know, we are conscious about uh, um, the issues of running historic vehicles, but the same as the steam train, the heritage sector in many different areas, aeroplanes, etc. You know, that is an issue that's been looked at. The amount, though, if I was honest with you, I'm not trying to make excuses for the heritage sector, the amount is infinitesimally small when you actually compare it to the amount of CO2 that's coming from all those other sources. That doesn't mean to say in the future people won't be doing something about it. If you look at modern vehicles, it is an issue that the army is having to face up to. And even the army has policies about trying to get to electric drive vehicles. But you can imagine in modern sorts of, of areas, um, looking at the army wants to be a, you know, where it possibly can, a green organisation. It sounds ironic, doesn't it? Uh, at the same time, when you're talking about things like national security, defence, etc., you don't want to find you're doing it in a manner that if push came to shove, you don't want to be the people with your one arm tied behind your back because we decided to go all green and therefore your uh, vehicles or your capabilities are way behind those of an enemy who might want to take advantage of you. So that's an issue that the army is facing up to. It's a very conscious, you know, contemporary issue, obviously, and uh, something that us in the museum sector as well uh, is a drive for us all to become an awful lot greener, an awful lot, can we recycle more? Can we do things with... Uh, as the whole world should, obviously, as a, as a part of its agenda. Um, the modern vehicles, I mean, there's other issues as well, which, you know, you just have to be honest and say an awful lot of military um, vehicles, the way they're used, etc. they also get exemptions. So for the Challenger 2, the decibel level is way higher than what would be, ever be allowed for a civilian car um, that's coming out the back of that. So um, it's another one of those sort of, you know, it's one of those exemptions literally because they think that this is worth doing nobody wants it but they think it's worth doing from the point of view of actually that's a vehicle that may save your life save your liberty at some particular point so we'll make an excuse for it um right next question from um louise uh, banks um 
sorry, Louis Banks, I do apologise, Louis. Louis Banks, age nine, asks, what's your favourite tank? His tank is a Tiger II. This is a tricky one, Louis, because I've been asked this before, and if I'm honest, I don't really think I've got a favourite. There's some, if I'm honest, Louis, it's, it's not so much the favourite tank, it's a story that goes with that vehicle. And um, because of that, it's one of those ones where I'll have a go at maybe in this time, I'll get around to doing my top five tanks, but I think it's going to be about the story that goes with the vehicle. Not so much, I think that's my favourite there. There are tanks where you walk around the corner in the tank museum, you go past on a regular basis, etc. Um, and there's tanks, uh, boy, it's a tank museum, are we lucky to have, you know, no one else has got something like Little Willie, the first tank really, the first tank ever. So there's tanks that you can't help but have a fondness, a respect, a, a sort of real interest in that way. But if you're trying to sort of line them up, you know, which one would I just want if I was allowed one in the back garden? Um, I find that hard. I just don't really have a top top one in that sort of way. Um, so, yeah, it's a tricky question. I always think it's a question that we need about five other qualifiers afterwards. If you could own it, for example, or if you had one that you could sell, because what would make the most money? Or if you had one that... Uh, you know, you wanted to make the model of, or it, it's, it's, those are the sorts of things that are well, that you almost want to qualify to that. But anyway, Louis, I, it's not a great answer. Um, and by the way, your Tiger II, it's one of those ones where we've actually made a film about the Tiger II, which if you go to YouTube, have a look on that. So there's one of those tank chats on the Tiger II there, as well as the other Tiger family we did some time ago. But you might like to have a look at that if, if your favourite's a Tiger II. Um, Kurt Nolan, is it? Um, he's asked the question, who owns the tanks at the Tank Museum? Um, so this is the nerdy bit again. We have, um, we are an independent charity. That charity has a board of trustees. There's always serving military on that board, um, but there's others. We have people representing business, industry, other um, technology, all sorts of things across that board. So hopefully we've got a nice wide ranging skill set. That board technically owns the collection because the uh, we have a trustee, um, we have a charitable status, a lot of the equipment, we do this on behalf of the Royal Armoured Corps, etc. So we have a very strong link with the serving military, but technically uh, vehicles entering our collection, if they're gifted, they become the property of the trustees of the Tank Museum. Um, and they are the people that ultimately own them. We have vehicles on loan to us. So obviously, again, there's an agreement there where the vehicle re uh, remains, you know, the legal owner is legal title remains with that person who's lent it to us. And we also have a couple of vehicles on loan to us from the army. So obviously there, there, there are military vehicles as well um, that are here. So they technically still belong to the army, but that's very few in number. The vast majority of items at the tank museum are owned by the trustees. So I hope that clears it up. It might lead to other questions, you know, like are we allowed to sell them? What do we do about swapping, etc.? And uh, in a way, it kind of also leads on to another question there, which is not so much where we get them from, but Roger Kidd asks, you know, are we hoping to try and acquire a Merkava, an M1 and a Leopard 2? Um, the short answer is yes, we do. We've had a long old struggle um, trying to find ways to acquire an M1 from the Americans and Abrams. Uh, Leo 2s, the problem with Leopard 2s, is on the whole, most countries that's had a Leopard 2 or um, has got rid of its Leopard 2s, they tend to go back to be either revamped and to go back out or be sold on or passed on or enter service in another country. So in a sense, there hasn't been that number of Leopard 2s that have been up for disposal or coming out of service in a manner that there's one spare for the Tank Museum. Um, so with a Leopard 2, we're still on the case, still really want one of those. And as for a Merkava, yes, we are in discussions. We have been before, all sorts of issues. You can imagine this is not always going to be the top agenda of some countries and some militaries at certain times, but opportunities do arise. Um, things grow and fall. And, you know, the time I've been at the Tank Museum, you can chart that I've got files that thick on different uh, approaches, or we've got a defence attaché who comes to the museum. It's, he's going to be his absolute determination to make this happen. 
Um, and, and it will. There will be a time when all of a sudden those barriers that are in the way, things happen in the right manner, um, what was at the bottom of that person's in tray will finally will work its way to a point or, or, or something will happen or make these things come together. And uh, at the moment, we are talking at the moment with the Israelis about getting a Merkava in the collection um, because that would be another. There are three tanks you mentioned there, all tanks we would love to see represented um, because they're important, as you can imagine, for very different reasons, but uh, really important for us to try and get hold of. And uh, that touches on another question other people ask. We do have a wants list. Um, we, we run that by, it's not just what me or David Fletcher or one person at the Tank Museum thinks they want. We have a wants list for what we consider really significant vehicles that ought to be in the collection. And uh, we try and justify that. It's always very hard trying to sort of, you know, level playing field. How do you put one tank against another? This one's more important or whatever. It's, it's never that simple to be able to do. But we also have a wants list of vehicles that we want so that we can run them on a regular basis because we know running those vehicles too often um, and we do run don't forget most summers we're running pretty much every day something or other a few vehicles in the arena as part of our tanks in action display what are the vehicles we can acquire a number of and looking to the future sustain and that's a big issue which obviously we're facing um, not that long ago, we were running whatever we could try and get out and run. I say whatever, actually, you know, obviously there was a bit of judgment going on there. But the key aim was to get things going into that arena, helping us put us on the map, getting an audience base coming in. If we're looking to the future, there's a number of those vehicles we can't run in the same way as we did before. Spare parts aren't available. We want to try and keep originality where we can. But what are those vehicles? What are the type of vehicle that's out there with a stock of spares that we might be able to acquire and be able to keep going for some years to come? So we've got the skill set in the workshop. We know we can keep them running to a certain degree. And that's a little bit of work that certainly Chris Van Schadenberg, our head of collections, is looking at at the moment. How can we keep things going again uh, years into the future rather than just thinking of next summer or, or now we've got over that initial hurdle of we put ourselves on the map as this sort of organisation. How are we going to sustain that? How are we going to keep that going? Because we know so many of you come to the museum like to see a vehicle running. Um, Rosie Smith has asked on behalf of Eddie, who's age 10, um, about the King Tiger. Well, Eddie, I'd kind of almost jumped the gun a bit have a look at that chat on YouTube. If you like King Tigers, Eddie, have a look at the chat we did on YouTube and also look on our workshop diary because there's, there's bits there as well. We were moving the King Tiger into its new position for our new World War II displays. When they open, you better come and have a look at those. Have a look at some of those videos because there's, there, there's information on the tank, but there's also some great footage of the tank being moved around as well. Um, so that's the sort of area where we've actually done quite a bit already. So have a look there, Eddie, and see what you think. And uh, another one, Eddie, if you're about age 10, have you had a look at what Claire's put up about making your own tank? If you're like the King Tigers, how about making a King Tiger in some sort of manner out of uh, material at home? And then you post that photographs of that on our website and so everybody else can see. And we're doing a bit of a competition there. So that's something. If you've got an interest in King Tigers, here's your chance to make your own one. So um, look at that bit. And uh, Paul Kerr, he's asked a question about muzzle brakes. And uh, again, as you can imagine, we get a range of different uh, questions coming in. Muzzle brakes an interesting one because uh, you can go very, very nerdy on muzzle brakes. But I'll just do a quick explanation. Muzzle brakes. So when you look at a tank and you see sometimes, for example, on Sherman Firefly, that little round bulbous bit at the end with some holes in, other tanks, other types of uh, what looks like sometimes something with holes in, obviously a hole where the round comes out in the middle of it. What's that for? So I've made my own muzzle brake. So again, um, here's, a, here's a clue how you might make a muzzle brake if you're making your homemade tanks. If only I could find it. Where did I put it? Ugh, let me find the muzzle brake. Here it is. So here's my homemade muzzle brake. So it's a paper towel. Um, inner tube, as it were, cardboard, uh, and a toilet roll um, tube. A rare thing, the toilet roll tube, of course. So I actually actually have to fist that one out of the bin. Um, but the idea is, so if you can imagine, this is the barrel of the gun, this part here, and there's a tank turret at the end of it. It fires the round up the barrel and it comes out the end. And this is a bit on the end here 
we are calling the muzzle brake. And the idea is what you're really trying to do when a gun fires, huge amounts of explosion in that gases expand. And that's what forces when that gun fires, that's what forces around up the barrel and out the end. And the welly behind all that gas pushes that round downrange to wherever the target is. Now, that gas going that way, and again, I won't go into too much all the scientific laws, but basically when there's that reaction, um, you've got a reaction of the force going backwards and what we'd normally call a recoil. So when you see guns fires, then they recoil. Now, that force on something like a tank gun where they need a huge amount of power to push that round out with enormous amount of kinetic energy force behind it to smash into normally an enemy tank, what you're looking at there is therefore a great sense of recoil, you know, an enormous amount um, coming back with that force there. So inside a confined space of a turret, you'll see things called recuperators. So you can squash a liquid as a way of stopping a bit of that force going backwards, because if, if you're not careful, that recoil could smash against the back of the tank. Um, so what, or inside the turret sort of thing, because the amount of recoil that's going on there. Sometimes they use springs as a way of stopping that. And another way they can help lessen the amount of recoil when the gun fires is, if you can imagine the round comes out the barrel, it comes out the end, then all that following force and gases expand rapidly. And so when you see a gunfire, you see all that smoke and uh, you can see it come out the end with a tremendous amount of force. Now, if you capture some of that hot gases force as it's coming out the end of the barrel and rapidly expanding, if you capture it on the inside, on what they call the baffles on the inside of your muzzle brake, it helps instead of that going back that way, the gas is pushing forward on this and it helps stop the recoil so it pushes it back the other way. And there's different designs for different ways of capturing that uh, hot gas on the muzzle brake. So you'll see some of them, like on our Sherman tank, the Fury tank, it's got flanges on the edge there, baffles they act at, so that there's more than one that can uh, take away some of that force and help that not recoil so far. Um, there's different methods for doing that. And there's other advantages to actually having a muzzle brake as well, because um, there's a tendency for when guns fire um, for them to lift as well. And you'll see that with rifle shooters, pistol shooters, etc. And they can use a muzzle brake or a, a, a baffle arrangement at the end as well, or compensators sometimes called. Um, and the idea there is if you angle the gases, it stops the gun going upwards as well. So that's another thing. And you'll see that as well by putting that angle. So, for example, on something like an AK-47, the, the rifle, the, the, the automatic rifle um, designed just after the Second World War, the AK-47 has got a curve on the end there, and it's actually a curve at a slight angle. And the idea there is, so when they're firing their gun, it has a tendency to drift upwards and to one side. That curve helps compensate against that. So it's another thing you can do. Uh, downsides of muzzle brakes, uh, the downside of them, for example, what can sometimes happen is uh, it means the exhaust gases that are coming out behind that round, they are actually fed sideways more and the noise level as well for the, if you've got infantry, others standing around the place, the noise level goes up, the decibel level sometimes almost doubles if you're behind the gun at that particular time. So that's not good. The fact you're spreading the blast out is another one of those things, instead of letting it go forward, sometimes that leads to something called obscuration, which means basically there's lots of smoke, dust, things flown up around the place, which means that you can't see quite as quickly. Um, and the other problem with muzzle brakes as well, Nowadays, many tanks are firing what they call armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabo rounds. In other words, a cylinder goes up the barrel, it comes out the end, um, and those cylinder parts fly away, leaving that long uh, metal dart flying towards the enemy tank. Now, a muzzle brake can catch on the edges of that discarding part of the sabo, the cylinder bit that's coming off, coming out the end. And that's why you'll see most modern tank guns fitted to tanks these days don't have a muzzle brake on because they have the problem there that anything that might interfere with that accuracy of the round or stop the, uh, uh, the sabo parting from the round 
clearly and sensibly without any interference, then you can imagine that's going to be a bit of a problem for them. Um, but uh, I hope that basically explains that there is a lot more complexity, as you can imagine, and science underneath this. Um, but I hope that's a basic explanation about what a muzzle brake does and what it's there for. And as I mentioned, if you're going to enter our competition, the youngsters, there's a simple way of making a muzzle brake there. Um, but don't forget to put a hole in the end, otherwise your tank gun wouldn't work if it was flat across the end there. But you'll see weird and wonderful different shaped muzzle brakes if you look at photographs of tanks especially. And they really started in the, uh, well actually they've started with, with, with guns, with normal pistols, rifles, shooting ones if you watch the, the Olympic type things, they've got them there as well. Um, they're on artillery pieces if you look at them, uh, again to try and reduce that recoil. Um, and they were put on tanks, you know, if you look at like tanks like the Sherman Firefly, you'll see one on the end there, a lovely round looking, uh, very elegant looking muzzle break on the firefly. So that's answered some of your questions. Uh, I'm not quite sure how long I've talked for. We'll change this. Let's see how it works. Um, and let's see what's the best way of trying to answer your questions. But hopefully that's answered some of them. Do keep them coming in. And as I said, there are going to be um, other films which some of your questions you already asked I'll try and put together in some of those other films and you'll see those ones coming together um, but here hopefully a bit of an effort to answer some of them there and again I would argue he says taking a slurp from uh, his I Love Tanks mug that you can get from the uh, Tank Museum shop don't forget to keep us supporting us by uh, perhaps ordering something off uh, online from the shop there if you're a model maker brilliant well done all of you who've responded by posting those pictures of your models on our Facebook site. Keep doing that. And isn't it great as well, seeing you all cooperating, talking to each other, explaining things you've done, and give that advice. It's a great time at the moment for talking to each other, being a bit kinder than usual. Uh, watch your comments. Let's make sure we're all being sensible about what we're up to and doing. And, uh, and pass on, you know, look at the skills that you model makers have shown already pass those skills around, pass them on, and thank you so much for that effort you put in with, uh, you look, if you haven't found it yet, go on Facebook, look at the pictures of all those models, people out there are doing it. And also, thank you so much. I'm really pleased to be able to tell you that we've had a, a glut of orders in the shop. Bear with us, if it takes a little bit longer for us to sort them, you can imagine at this particular time, it's not that easy, but um, keep those orders coming in because when you're doing that, you're helping to support the charity, the collection I mentioned earlier, and uh, that helps us, as I keep saying, keep going. So keep at it, keep safe, um, keep watching, and we'll hopefully answer more of your questions soon. Thanks very much. We are a charity here at the Tank Museum, so if you can support us, please do. Consider joining our Patreon scheme or becoming a member of the Friends any donations will go directly towards the Tank Museum and its activities.